Scattering at an interface, examples. To wrap up a lot of what we've been talking about with waves, I want to work through a rather detailed example about scattering at an interface where we set up an interface and calculate everything about it. How much reflects, how much transmits, critical angle, Brewster's angle, all this sort of stuff. Once we get through that, I have a few more fun examples to explain why we have sunrises, sunsets. We're now in a good position to understand stuff like that. Rainbows and polarized sunglasses. So our first example that will be rather mathematically intense, scattering at an interface. So here's our problem. We have a left-hand circularly polarized wave and it's incident from air onto water at 53 degrees angle of incidence. Based on that and the refractive indices given in the problem, we want to calculate a bunch of stuff. Number one, calculating the critical angle for both polarizations. Second part, the Brewster's angle for both polarizations. Then look at Snell's law, angle of transmission for both polarizations. Calculate the impedance in both of the media, because we're given refractive index, and that's not immediately impedance. Calculate the reflection coefficient for both polarizations, transmission coefficient for both polarizations. Then the overall reflectance of the wave, overall transmittance of the wave. Then we'll add the overall reflectance and transmittance and see if we get 100%. And if not, why not? And then finally last, what is the polarization of the reflected wave? Well, right away, critical angle, Brewster's angle, angle of transmission, all this angle stuff is the same for both polarizations. So really, we only have to calculate a single number for parts one, two, and three. And of course, calculating the impedance in both of the media, that also does not depend on polarization. From that point forward, it is dependent on polarization. The other thing we have to think more about is in seven, eight, and nine, when we're calculating the overall reflectance and transmittance. Because remember, the TE and TM polarizations differ, they're different. And our input wave is circularly polarized. In other words, we have a TE polarized wave and a TM polarized wave at the same time. They're just 90 degrees different to give us our circularly polarized wave. So we have to account for both of those when we're evaluating overall reflectance and transmittance. Okay, let's dive into the solution. Part one, calculate the critical angle for both TE and TM polarizations. Well, we already mentioned it's the same for both, so we really only have to calculate one critical angle. So we refer to our equation that we derive for the critical angle, which is the inverse sine of N2 divided by N1, but this is only valid when N1 is greater than N2. Well, for us, N1, the input medium, has a refractive index of 1, and the output medium has a refractive index of about 1.33. So we see right away that this condition is not met. In other words, it's a little bit of a trick question. We actually don't have a critical angle. And that is the answer to this. We would not give a number answer. We could put numbers in for N2 and N1. We'll have a complex number for the critical angle. And that makes no sense. That's not the correct answer. The correct answer is that there is no critical angle. And that is simply because the input medium has a lower refractive index. Now, just for fun, let's pretend it was the other way around, and we had uh, our electromagnetic wave going from water into air, in which case we would have a critical angle, and that would be about 48.9 degrees. That is not the case for this problem. We're just pretending the refractive indices were the other way around and exercising the critical angle equation. But that is not an answer for this problem. Part two, the Brewster's angle for both TE and TM polarizations. And I'm just thinking now, when we first stated this problem, I probably misspoke when I said all of the angle stuff is independent of polarization. Uh, I was looking at that as if it was just angle of incidence, angle of transmission, angle of refraction, that kind of stuff. But Brewster's angle can be different for the different polarizations. So first, there is no permeability given. If we're just handed refractive index and we're talking about light, it's almost always a good thing to assume that we just have no permeability. So when we turn that off, what we see 
is that there's only a Brewster's angle for the TM polarization. The TE polarization does not have a Brewster's angle because the permeability will be the same on either side of the interface. So this is the normal case. We're ignoring permeability and our Brewster's angle equation just reduces to this simple equation. Well, we solve that for the Brewster's angle and now we can plug in our numbers for N2 and N1. We can plug in our numbers and do the math and we end up with a Brewster's angle for the TM polarization component of 53 degrees. So notice that is our angle of incidence at 53 degrees. So our wave happens to be incident at the Brewster's angle. So remember what happens at the Brewster's angle. This TM polarization will completely transmit. There is no reflected wave for the TM polarization. So we have a circularly polarized wave coming in. The TM polarization component of that completely transmits. That means the only thing that will reflect is a TM polarized wave. And that'll come up again at the end when we talk about the polarization of the reflected wave. Part three, what is the angle of transmission for both polarizations? This is independent of polarization. The angle information of incident reflected transmitted is independent of polarization, so it's only a single angle that we need to find. This is an application of Snell's law, N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2, where after the theta t, the angle of transmission, so we can solve Snell's law for theta t. Now we're in a position to plug in our numbers. We have our two refractive indices, N1 is 1, N2 is 1.33, and then we have sine of our angle of incidence, which is given to be 53 degrees. So we plug in those numbers and now we can do the math and we calculate the angle of transmission is 37 degrees. So the angle in the transmitted media is less than our angle of incidence. And that is because the refractive index is higher in the second medium. Part four, impedance of both media. So this is done independent of polarization, independent of angle of incidence. This is just materials related. It actually has nothing to do really with our waves. So first, we're talking about light and we're given refractive indices. Anytime that happens, we can almost always assume that the permeability is negligible. So that means we set the relative permeability to one on both sides of the interface. When that happens, we can evaluate our impedance as the free space impedance divided by refractive index. And we have the same equation for both media. We know that the free space impedance is always 376.73 ohms. There's other decimals, but that's not too important for here. And then we plug in our refractive indices and do the math. And we come out with the impedance for medium one being the free space impedance because it is free space refractive index of 1.0. The impedance in the second medium is 283.9 ohms. And values like that are much, much more typical for dielectric stuff. We had done some previous examples using impedance of 1 and 2, but values on the order of 2 to 300 ohms are much more typical. Part 5, the reflection coefficient for both TE and TM polarizations. Now the reflection and transmission are polarization dependent, so we'll have to do two calculations here. One for the TM polarization, the other for, T, for TE. So we just go ahead and write our two Fresnel equations for the reflection of these polarizations. They look very similar. The difference is this particular theta has an I subscript indicating it's the angle of incidence. And down here we have a T subscript indicating this theta is the angle of transmission. So the subscripts on the angles have danced around a little bit. Otherwise, the equations are the same. And for both, the numerator and denominator are the same. It's just this sign difference. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug in all of our numbers because we know everything now. We calculated our pedance in a previous part. We calculated our angle of transmission. We can plug in all of those numbers for both the reflection for TE, reflection for TM, plug it into our calculator and we get two answers. And we see that the reflection coefficient for the TE polarized wave is about negative 0.3.
And this negative is, doesn't mean that's incorrect. That just means the reflected wave has a 180 degree phase shift relative to the incident wave. For the TM polarization, we get a number that's way down 10 to the minus 6. This really is effectively 0. So we'll just call the reflection of the TM polarization 0. Part 6. Now the transmission coefficient for both TE and TM polarizations. Since we already calculated the reflection coefficient, we don't have to go to the Fresnel equation for the T and TM polarizations, although we could. But since we already exercised that in the previous example, let's do the shortcut method. Let's look at our equation for how the reflection coefficient is related to the transmission coefficient. We just calculated the reflection coefficient. So we can plug in our number and we get the transmission coefficient for the TE polarized wave, about 0.72. Now the relation between the reflection and transmission coefficient for the TM polarization is a little more complicated simply because it has those cosines there, but it's still, I think, a simpler equation than the Fresnel equation, which we're still free to use. So we'll solve this equation for the transmission coefficient. Now we can plug in all the numbers that we know. We found previously that the reflection coefficient for this polarization was zero, and we know our angles. And we can turn our calculator and we see the transmission coefficient for the TM polarization is about 0.75. Now we would like to get the overall reflectance. And since we have a circularly polarized wave coming in, that contains both TE and TM. So we've sort of separated that information, analyzed TE and TM separately. But now that we're interested in the overall reflection, we need to bring that information back together again. So individually, we'll calculate the reflectance of each polarization separately before we bring it together. That's just the absolute value of the reflection coefficient squared. We know the reflection coefficient's magnitude squared, and we get the reflectance for both the TE and TM polarizations. Now we want to tie these together. So if we have a circularly polarized wave, we have equal power in the TE and TM polarizations. That's where these 50% come from. This is telling us how much power was in the applied wave in the TE polarization and how much power was in the TM polarization in our applied wave. So that was 50-50 because it was circularly polarized. So we take how much power was in our TE polarization and multiply by the reflectance of the TE. We add to that the percentage power in the TM polarization of our incident wave and then multiply by the reflectance of the TM polarization. We plug in our numbers and that gives us the overall reflectance of 0 0.038. So overall reflectance is not very high here, about 4%. Now we'll calculate the overall transmittance, and this works the same way. We're handling our wave separately, the TE and TM polarizations, and then in the very last step, we bring it together to get the overall transmittance. So for the transmittance, we have a slightly more complicated equation to calculate that from our transmission coefficients. But we have all these numbers now, we're in a good position to calculate those. We throw in all of our known numbers, we get out our calculator, and then we get the transmittance for the TE and TM separately. So the transmittance for the TE polarization, 0.92, and transmittance for TM, 1.0. That's because this TM polarization, we're incident at the Brewster angle, it is completely transmitted. Now we're in a position to tie this together. Remind you, these 50% mean in our applied wave, 50% of the power was in the TM polarization and 50% of the power was in the TM polarization. Then we multiply each of these by their transmittances, add them together, and we get the overall transmittance. Plug in the numbers, and we get an overall transmittance of about 0.962. Now here's our check to see how our numbers turn out. 
the power has to go somewhere. So if we add our reflectance and transmittance together, the overall total reflectance and transmittance, we should get 100% unless we're analyzing something that has loss, but we're not doing that here. So we want to add our R and T, the overall R and Ts. We plug in the numbers we just calculated, and in fact, we get exactly 1.0. Now this does not tell us 100% for sure that our answers are correct, but certainly if that didn't add to one, there's something wrong. So we are observing conservation of power here. That's a very good thing. Uh, I would tend to trust these calculations, but remember it's not a 100% guarantee that it's right. But if you don't get 1.0, it is a 100% guarantee that it's wrong. The very last thing, the polarization of the reflected wave. And I really already gave away the answer to this, but the wave is incident at the Brewster's angle. The Brewster's angle means that the TM polarization is completely transmitted. Our input wave is circularly polarized, so it contains both TE and TM components. So if the TM component is completely transmitted and the TE wave is only partially transmitted, then that means the only thing that's getting reflected is the TE polarization. So our reflected wave can only be TE polarized. So in a way it was an easy answer because our wave was incident at Brewster's angle. Now let's move on to some more fun examples. Why is it we have sunrises and sunsets and what are some of the consequences of that? So here's the earth. And surrounding that, unfortunately, I'm not showing it, but there's an atmosphere. And the atmosphere has a refractive index, and it starts at 1, and it grades to something like 1.0000003. And so light from the sun does slowly refract, and it kind of bends like this through the atmosphere. So if we're standing right here, and we're if we look forward, we only can see everything above this line, nothing below it, because that's the horizon line. So if we were standing here, to us, the light is coming in this direction. And so if we extrapolate that, it looks like the sun is still above the horizon, but that's not true. The sun is actually below the horizon. Now this has some interesting consequences. So I'm teaching this class in El Paso, Texas. Here are our GPS coordinates. Now, at the equinox, this is the time of year, the Earth's tilt is neither away or, or away or toward the sun. This means in principle that day and night should have equal time, yet it actually doesn't because of refraction. In fact, our days are lasting longer because of this refraction. At sunrise and sunset, that sun always appears above the horizon before it's actually there. So even though in El Paso, Texas, the equinox the orbital equinox, or how, what are you call it, that occurs on September 22nd in 2012, and it's roughly the same time each year. But in reality, we don't have equal day and night until September 26th, and that's if we account for refraction. So on September 26th, that's actually if we look at the light and dark, we have equal light and dark. But we could also say on the day of equal light and dark, Technically, there should be more dark because that sun is spending more time below the horizon than above. But due to refraction, it changes a little bit. To give you an idea for the numbers, on the actual day of equinox, September 22nd, the duration of our day is 12 hours, 7 minutes, 18 seconds. And that's accounting for refraction. So the day's a little bit longer than it should be otherwise. Now, on the day where we have equal day and night, the duration is 11 hours 59 minutes and 36 seconds again accounting for refraction so we, what we can conclude is that our days are about seven minutes longer every day than they would be if there was no such thing as refraction so think about that we get a whole extra seven minutes of daylight because of refraction and i think that's pretty cool rainbows did you know that there is always multiple rainbows? It's not a magical thing that just happens sometimes. It's just when the rainbow is intense enough, we can see it. Those other rainbows get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And I believe they've observed out to like 17 different rainbows. 
They are always there. It's just that we can't always see them. If you took a camera and you left the exposure open for a while, a lot of cameras can start to resolve those other rainbows. So why do we even get rainbows? If we look at a raindrop, so I'm drawing a, a sphere here representing a raindrop, and we have the light coming in for our, from our sun. So it's coming in at an angle less than the critical angle, so it bends a little bit. Now you'll notice that white light starts to spread in colors. Refraction happens here, and the refractive index of water is slightly different for each of the different colors. That means it will bend slightly different for each of those colors. So now those colors start to separate a little bit. When it hits the back part of the raindrop, it's actually incident at an angle that will totally reflect. And then now it has more time to spread even more, and then it refracts coming out. And so those colors come out separated and viewing that from far enough away we see that as a rainbow and if we look at the angle between the incoming light and the output light it's about a 42 degree let's call it 45 degrees but technically it's 42 degrees this is why we really only ever see rainbows in the morning or at night when the sun is somewhat low on the horizon so imagine the path of the light from the the cloud or sorry from the sun to the rain to your eye that angle here has to be 42 degrees and so that happens when the sun is relatively low on the horizon when it's way up high you would also have to be flying in an airplane or something to see a rainbow looking down but you can still see rainbows if you have a garden hose and you have that spray mode you can spray the water look at where the sun is coming down and, and move your head so that there's about a 45 degree angle there and you'll see a rainbow in that mist coming out of your garden hose now the other rainbows happen because there's multiple paths and it's a little bit more complicated here than i'm describing and the light can come out in multiple angles and there's always multiple rainbows it's just that they get dimmer as the rainbows go out and uh, I personally have only ever seen that second rainbow on a really intense rainbow. I've never seen the third or the fourth or the fifth. But I understand that they're there. The last thing we'll talk about is polarized sunglasses. So remember this whole deal with Brewster's angle. Reflection for the TM polarization is always weaker than the reflection for the TE polarization. So sunlight reflecting off water or glass will tend to be TE polarized. And so here we're looking at a frog and we really can't see much of the frog below the water. And that's because the sun bouncing off the surface is brighter than the light coming from underneath of the water. Well, if we used a, a polarized filter that blocks the TE polarization, now we don't we're not seeing that and the light coming from underneath of the water can be much stronger relative to that sunlight that we still see bouncing off of the surface and so fishermen love to wear polarized sunglasses because if they're fishing in clear water they can see below the water when we drive we like to use polarized sunglasses because it reduces glare off other people's windows and stuff that can shine in our eyes uh, one kind of drawback of wearing polarized sunglasses is sometimes if you're looking at your cell phone or your GPS, which you shouldn't do while you're driving, should not look at your cell phone, but it may appear black to you. And if you tilt your head, you can see it. If you have an LCD television, the same thing would happen. Put on polarized sunglasses and tilt your head, and at some angle, the television goes black. That's kind of a neat effect. So. Polarized sunglasses are usually good, but there are some drawbacks too. My GPS always seems to be black when I'm wearing my polarized sunglasses, and I have to tilt my head to see it, and I don't like that. So just to sort of drive this home, here's a plot of the reflection for both of the polarizations. And while we have the Brewster's angle only for one specific angle, we can see that the reflection of the TM polarization is almost always lower than the TE polarization. So that's why light is always reflected with TE polarization. And it's not pure TE. There's still some TM components there, but it's mostly TE polarized. And so if we block the TE polarization, we can reduce glare and things like that. 
So I hope this lecture was informative.